Friday at last. That's right, Diane. Friday at last. What? Friday. What was that? Oh, I thought you were tapping to get my attention. Oh. <laughs> Miss my cues. I need to figure out a way to move you over a little bit so I can actually see you. Because oh. I'm not, I'm not like, yeah, you're out of my view. Out of my vision. Can't see. Oh. <laughs> oh, hello, everyone. Hello. It is Friday night. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Diane. Hello, Amy. Hello, Dr. Jim is in the house. Oh, shit. Dave Schumacher is here. Oh, you know, that's going to be a horrible show now because he shipped up. <laughs> oh, man. We got Karen, another Diane. We got Shauna, and Kimberly, and Faith. We got a whole bunch of people popping in. This is great. Good to see everyone. We have a, we're, we're going to have a guest tonight. As soon as I get through the rules, we're going to bring a guest on. This is good because I didn't have to talk all night. This is great. I love a show when I don't have to talk a lot. Actually, I, I, I do just talk a lot. Anyway, Tim. Wow, Tim Binga. What? <laughs> the librarian's in the house. Glenda, Raw Side Paranormal, Jaya. Wow, lots of people coming in. All right, so let me go over the rules here. Um, just for any newbies or if you just like hearing me talk about the rules, because sometimes I mess up when I do it. So rule number one is that you are welcome to ask questions. That's what this show is about. It's, it's about learning. Um, you're, we're going to we're going to talk about things. We're going to you're going to talk to a guest. We're going to learn what they have to say about certain topics and subjects and maybe comments and stuff like that. I don't know. We'll go off topic, too. Rule number two is that I don't know everything. I just I, that's it, period. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know everything. Uh, and that also applies to guests. We don't always know everything. We, we usually don't know everything, but we know a little bit of, of stuff. And if we have to, we can look it up. I don't know what I'm doing with this hand here. I don't know why this hand is keep doing this. Um, rule number three is that we follow the Patrick Swayze rule here, and that is be nice. That's basically it. Uh, you can be in the chat room. You can discuss things. You can debate things. You can disagree. Um, that's fine, but do not devolve into name calling or just don't be a dick. That's what it comes down to. All right. Don't be a dick. Be kind. Uh, be kind. Rewind. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't rewind, Donna's going to boot you out of the chat room and you're <laughs> gone forever. That's it. Uh, rule number four is that if you do have a question, please do us a favor. Put a capital Q in front of it. That way Donna can see it and put it in the queue. Uh, and because we have a guest tonight, the first hour, I'm going to have a conversation with them. We're going to talk back and forth. We're going to ask each other questions and this and that. And then we will save your questions for the second hour because that's your time to shine. And rule number five is my favorite rule of all. Drink up. Uh, enjoy the night. Mm. Oh, the Kraken. I love the Kraken. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Let me switch to. I did not make the drink. She did not make the drink. I did. And I was watching TV at the time. So I wasn't paying attention to what I was pouring. Yes, I was. All right. Let's switch to this. Let's bring on our guest, the awesome Alex Matsuo. Am I saying that right? Do I pronounce that right? Yeah. Yeah. You okay. got it. I'm just making sure because I'm horrible with names. And I, I to be honest, like the behind the scenes stuff. Whenever I mention you, which is not often, I don't talk about you a lot. <laughs> yes, I do. No. Uh, but I'm like, it's Alex Mat Matsuo Mat Matsuo. I don't, I don't know. So I actually listened to some other videos this afternoon and listened to other people pronounce it. And I was like, all right, I think I'm okay. I think I'm no. okay. Matsuo is close is close enough. I mean, some people like to go the really hardcore Japanese pronunciation and go Matsuo, but I, I say Matsuo. So Mats Matsuo. Okay. Matsuo. Yeah. Matsuo. Right. <laughs> Matsuo. All right. I always like to get it. I, I, I try to get it right, but all right, I'm babbling. Anyway, how are you? I'm good. It's Friday evening. I got I'm drinking mead tonight. So I know you got cracking. I got my mead. Um and it's the weekend and I'm doing a lot of writing. So this is going to, this is a nice little break between, uh, between, uh, power, power writing sessions. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can relate. I, I know how that feels. Um, I, I have, I usually take a break by making like a TikTok video. I'll be nice. writing like hardcore researching, reading, writing and all this. And I'm like, my head hurts, my eyes hurt. And I'll go out into the hallway and be like, Hey, anyone want to be a ghost? And like, I'll get hands go up. Like, all right, let's make some videos. We'll take a break. 
Oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> love it. My, uh, whenever I have a guest on, especially first timers, um, my first question is always, what is your origin story? So tell us, who is Alex? Ooh, that's a good question. So uh, besides being a hot mess, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Uh, let's see, like I'm funny because of the trauma. It's all good. Um, so I am a, well, so my origin story is, you know, I like a lot of people's origin stories. I had experiences I couldn't explain while I was a kid. Um, after my first experience happened, I kind of went, oh, cool. But oh, my God, um, I wanted to dive in deeper, but I grew up in a very I grew up under a parent who was very conservative Christian. So anything in terms of like anything spooky, like are you afraid of the dark goosebumps, uh, scary stories to tell in the dark? Absolutely yeah, yeah. Not allowed. I mean, even Nancy Drew was kind of cutting it a little bit because, you know, sometimes Nancy Drew had a little spooky theme. Um, but of course, when you tell a kid they can't be into that, it's only going to make them even more interested. So um, and once I started driving, I started going out at night and I lived in San Diego. That's where I grew up. So it was a lot of old town San Diego, Whaley House, um, you know, those type of visits are going to like East County, San Diego, uh, in abandoned places. And, um, it's actually how I got into history too. Cause I would look into like the history and I was like, Hey, the, you know, these, these two areas could actually coexist with each other. And then, um, once I started, once I graduated from high school, I started college, um, got into a really bad accident. Um, so bad that I was, you know, ambulance, trauma room, very long hospital stay, had a spooky experience that lasted about eight months. To Even to this day, I go back and forth as to what exactly it is. Um, I did write a book about the experience, dedicated the last chapter to basically debunking myself. <laughs> Say oh, like, hey, okay. well, you know, looking into other explanations of what could have explained why I was seeing this bloody man in dressed in, at, like a motorcycle rider. Um, and at the time when I was having that whole experience, we could not, my mom and I could not find anyone to help us. Um, nobody to explain it. Nobody like really grew up in a Baptist church. Again, pastor was like, absolutely not. I'm not touching that. Um, the paranormal community in 2006 did not really exist back then. Besides some really questionable Yahoo message boards, <laughs> uh, you know, ASL. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, so we couldn't find anyone to either explain it or to provide some sort of, some sort of resolution. Ghost Hunters, a TV show, I think maybe was a year or two old at this point. So it's kind of still like people were getting into it, but not enough to be in the phone book or on social media. Um, and back a then, phone book? <laughs> a phone book? What's that? And back, I mean, back then, Facebook was just for college students. So right. Um, so, so yeah, uh, so couldn't find anyone to help us. And then I kind of got inspired after all that got resolved of like, well, Hey, maybe I can, maybe if I, I've always been interested in this, maybe if I learn more about it, I started taking like psychology classes in college. I was a theater major, but I'm sitting there trying to take psychology. Um, you know, just trying to, while I had the access to the college experience, right. um, right. so I was taking different, so classes like that as like my electives, I mean, theater is an elective for many other majors, but it was my main course of study. So psychology and history were my electives. Um, so after I graduated, uh, I started my own team called the Association of Paranormal Study. We are still going to this day. Uh, we started off doing residential cases um, quite a bit. Uh, I realized that we were very different from other teams because we were really trying to dive deep into like data collecting and making sure like Again, you know, me and my three college courses in psychology, I thought I was the Miss Know-it-all, um, <laughs> but enough to, to start questioning like, okay, are we doing more harm than good by being here? Um, the team is still going today. We don't do as many residential cases. A lot of times it's because the climate has changed so much. Um, you know, it's more than just people reaching out for help now. It's people who want us to help them make content, which... Yes. Which that's not, that's honestly, that's not my jam. Uh, 
if you have questions or you need help um, or you want to look at this from a I'm a skeptical believer. Um, so I'm not like on, completely on the side of skeptic, but I'm also not going to believe everything that I see online. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask questions. I will ask for data. Um, I will ask for, Hey, you know, you say this room was cold in that corner. Did you happen to take the, take your know, measure the temperature or, you know, what's, what was the weather like? So I, so I tend to ask questions like that. And I, that nickname kind of feels like more, it was bestowed upon me than me just coming up with it. It was more of, especially on TikTok. Once I started, once I started looking at videos on TikTok and giving my two cents, people were like, Oh, you're a skeptical believer. And I'm like, really? What? That seems like too ironic, too ironic of a name to have because yeah, they're kind of yeah. polar opposites, but they're like, no, you like you're not willing to believe everything. And I'm like, well, that's fair. I guess, I guess if there had to be a name with it. So I, I kind of wear it now as, as like, a, I don't know, badge of honor, but you know, um, but yeah, so that's pretty much my origin story. I had a bunch of experiences that I couldn't explain. Um, when I found myself in a situation where I needed help, couldn't find the help. So I decided to become the help and uh, it just kind of opened me up to a lot of different opportunities. Um, some great, some didn't turn out so great, uh, <laughs> including working for a pair of celebrity that ended badly um, and really getting a perspective of that celebrity side of the par of paranormalness, paranormal community. <laughs> paranormal. I call it. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, I was like, where, what is that word? What is the word for that? I, you know, people who've been on TV and then all of a sudden everybody oh, worships yeah. the ground. They walk on like, Paris and I've Lake. even found that with me. Like I've had a couple of TV opportunities and I noticed that like I got treated differently, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But it's like, I, I just happen to have a really interesting backstory. It's got nothing to do with my knowledge because, well, there was one documentary I was a part of where I was like the expert on certain lore and stories, but but the other times I've been on TV has been from the experiences from that hospital incident I told you about. And I'm like, that wasn't really like me having expertise or knowledge. It was just this really weird thing happened to me after I fell off a guardrail and a, and a highway overpass. So, <laughs> um, okay. That. Um, but yeah, a, a short story of that accident, hydroplaned on the freeway, got out of the car to get my stuff. Cause I knew they're going to have to tow my car. Another car came and hit me. I flipped onto the car, rolled off the car, rolled over the guardrail, and I fell 25 feet onto the road below. So Ow. vertically Ow. shattered my pelvis, broke three vertebrates in my back, shattered my tailbone, um, lots of internal organ damage. Um, so uh, 2005, <laughs> New Year's Eve. Yeah, 2005, New Year's Eve, going into 2006. Um wow. So, and the story that followed that was very, I guess people found it interesting. So I'm like, okay, well, and Haunted Hospitals was the first to show that story. And they actually came to me because they had heard through a friend of a friend of a friend of like, hey, you should talk to her. And I'm like, okay, cool. So, um, but yeah, so I've been in that sphere of, you know, being the camera on camera talent, but also working for someone who was on camera talent and just kind of seeing how people how those people exist and it just really disillusioned me from like okay and especially after i had my own tv opportunities i was like okay <laughs> like really made me so what, reconsider what, things. what is what was it what disillusioned you of, of what like what what really stands out that you were like i thought this was something cool but this sucks yeah, it was my very first TV opportunity for a show on Travel Channel. It was not Haunted Hospitals. Um, and I don't want to name because the people that I did that opportunity with, I'm no longer affiliated with, but sometimes I get nice messages from them. <laughs> um, and so what happened was we were supposed to do a spot at Old South Pittsburgh Hospital in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Uh, we were driving in from North Carolina. We were, I was driving, my friend were, my friend at the time were driving in from central North Carolina. So by the time we crossed the Tennessee border, we were informed that old South Pittsburgh hospital was shut down by the IRS for back taxes, but also for black mold. So basically they told us you have to come up with another story. 
So that was my red flag number one. I was like, okay, because they already had their crew there. And I'm like, okay. And when my when my group and I this when my this group and I had gone to Old South Pittsburgh before, we did hear a story about like the the main street, the main crossroads being haunted. And we briefly checked it out and we got a chance to go into a room in one of the buildings. Literally, I think the entire experience lasted maybe 30 minutes of just, hey, go up, do a quick AVP session and come back down. Maybe may have caught something weird. Um, and so they were like, OK, we're going to go with that. And I'm like. Really, like we caught one word that we thought may have been a name, but OK, we'll we'll go with it. So. As I was watching and, you know, signed the contracts and everything, um, they had two of my members go to another part of the street and basically go like they were giving a mediumship reading right then and there when they already knew the information. So <laughs> I was okay. like, okay, that's weird. You know, well, like for me, it was. It, it, I, I struggled initially with that. I was like, okay, well, I guess you could, we could theoretically recreate what transpired when we did go there. It's not how it happened. Yeah. It so, wasn't as a recreation though, right? <laughs> it wasn't a recreation. Okay. Um, and then as I was getting, I was signing the contracts and everything, I kind of had this panic with my group and I'm like, I don't think I can do this. I can't lie. Like, I'm also neurodivergent, so I, I'm lying is also very difficult for me to do. <laughs> so, um, well, and also not being able to understand inauthenticity in other people. That's, that is part of my being on the spectrum. I don't get sometimes, and I struggle with that. I really struggle with that. So I started crying on set. I'm like, I'm sitting like off to the side and I'm like bawling my eyes out. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then finally the producer came up to me. She was really nice, really understanding. And she said, well, how would you feel if you just exaggerated a little bit? And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and so I said, I, and I said, honestly, I can only stick to what I've had experienced and what I know. I mean, that's really all I can do. And my friend that was with me, she was like, Alex, you went, you went to school for acting, you're theater, you know, you do that. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm telling that character's truth. I'm not lying, <laughs> you know? So as we're filming, they did this horrific camera angle, by the way, the camera was down here. So, and I was about 150 pounds heavier at the time. So, I mean, all of this double chin and Everything just right up the nose. <laughs> right up the nose because they were trying to make the building look menacing, and I'm like, yeah, but you also make my double chin look menacing. Um, you know, it wasn't like high above where it's like, hey, it disappears. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there, we're telling the story, and the rest of my team members at the time did not really have an issue with the embellishment or flat out lying. Which you know what, it was an opportunity. I don't necessarily fault them for that. Our big break didn't come out of that. And I think there was an anticipation that a big break could come. Um, I would get notes when I was telling the story of like, you need to look more scared. You need to look more terrified. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, trying to, like how do I, how do I do this? So I probably had the least amount of screen time on that show, which is fine. Um, I'm grateful for the experience, but I'm also a little miffed that one, we did not get paid. We, they, we paid for our own hotel. We paid for our own travel. Um, <laughs> and meanwhile, this segment aired on travel channel. Wow. Yeah. So we got no compensation at all. And then when haunted hospitals, when that opportunity came about, I was very skeptical. I was like, eh, this is also my story, my very personal story, my personal trauma, right. you know, not just from the car accident, but also having that ex paranormal experience that I had, it was traumatic. So I was very clear with the producers. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to lie. And please do not change my story because it is what it is. Um, <laughs> Well, haunted hospitals did kind of redeem TV for me, but that first experience was awful. So I got very disillusioned 
by that. And that was literally just being in that segment for like maybe five minutes, maybe five minutes total. Gotcha. Um, after like eight hours of driving, paying like 200 bucks for a hotel room and driving all the way back and not seeing any sort of compensation for time or expenses. And um, because, you know, these a lot of these shows will take advantage of people who are desperate for their 15 minutes of fame. So, yeah. Uh, and we were one of them. I, I thought we were getting reimbursed because, uh, I mean, I came from the entertainment business in right. California. I'm like, um, and my, and my friend who arranged it, she was like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to, we're, we'll be compensated. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, at the very least for travel and expenses, you know, cause <laughs> at the very least. But, wow. Yeah. So that was, that was what disillusioned me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've, I've had several, I wouldn't, I, I don't think there are opportunities, but I, I've had uh, companies call me and say, Hey, we want to do this segment and this and that. Um, can you talk about it? Yeah, I can talk about it. And uh, I, I can say, yeah, I know this. I knew this about it. I know that. And they're like, well, yeah, we want we want a, a little different story, you know, and, and we would like you to say certain things. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I, I won't do that. Um, I mean, mostly because this is like this is my job, you know, and I'm not going to go on camera and lie <clears throat> about it. Um, and another thing, yeah, I mean, like the no compensation, that's just total straight up bullshit. Um, I, I asked for that right up front. Like, if you want me to travel somewhere, I, I'll gladly do it, but you you need to get me there, you know? Like, yeah. I'm not, I don't even like charge a fee or anything. just just get me there. And if I have to stay overnight, then yeah, you're going to pay for that overnight. And I yeah. usually say that up front, and that's the last I hear from them, you know? And I mean, it's like you said, it is it is like a, a commodity. They take advantage. They exploit uh, a group's willingness or, or, you know, hunger, if you will, to to be on TV, to be yep. famous because they yep. think, oh, this is my big break. I'm going to everyone's going to know about me now. And they take advantage of that. And it's yep. it's I it's mean, not. I, it's, it's not. It's not. Real, yeah. It's really, it's really not. Um, Haunted Hospitals did redeem TV for me a little bit because after they were talking to me about everything, I was also about two months out from weight loss surgery. So I wasn't at like my 100%. So I said like, well, so they wanted me to go to Atlanta. And I'm like, okay, well, we need to talk about how you're going to get me to Atlanta. And it was also during the pandemic. And they're like, well, we, we need you to drive. And I'm like, I... I can, but I'm going to have to stop every two hours to walk because I just had surgery uh, six weeks ago. So, but they covered my travel expenses. They covered my hotel and they gave me a per diem. So I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'll make it happen. And at, at the time, Atlanta, I want to say was six, eight hours away from where I was living. So I, I broke it up and they, they covered all of it. So they, they treated me very well. And besides, the only notes they really gave me when I told my story was don't smile as much, which especially when I'm talking about traumatic experiences, here we go. I'm doing it right now. You know, I kind of grin a little bit and I smile. Right. So that did feel a little unnatural for me, but they're like, well, we're not going to ask you to look more upset, but you do need to stop smiling. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's fair. That that's, that's fair. That's a, that's a vibe decision. Um, so that was fine. And then when I did two be scariest places in the world, they also covered my travel in my hotel. And when my flight got canceled and I had to stay in Knoxville, Tennessee for another night, they covered my hotel as well. So, um, but I was, but I also was not paid an appearance fee. So I was like, eh, but yeah, you know, it's, it, but that's, but you're right. They absolutely take advantage of people who are looking for that exposure. And for some reason, and this is my big complaint when it comes to the paranormal conference circuit or the event circuit is you get that one TV thing. And then now you're headlining every Paracon that year. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just like, okay. But at the same time though, being in the event circuit and the convention circuit, you're still paying your own way there. So it's like, you're basically doing all of this so you can be put on a banner on Facebook. So Right. right. We, we came across a guy and I'm not going to say his name. Um, so Austin, um, yeah. that it just, he, we, we, we were there. His show had not come out yet. 
but he was already telling everyone that he was set for life. Um, that oh, no. He's going to be doing conferences forever. He is set. He doesn't have to work another day in his life and this and that. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, what are you, what, what are you getting paid? And, and the conference we were at, I, as far as I know, they didn't pay so any, anybody coming in, you know, they gave you a booth and that was it. Yeah. And, like, you're not going to be rich off of this. You, no. It's got to be something more. Um, so it's kind of sad when you see that and, and you're right. Like you get one show or you appear somewhere and it's like, all of a sudden your name is in lights. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a shame because you get treated like that, but it really doesn't benefit the person themselves. You know? No, not person. really. I mean, yeah. a lot of people assumed, you know, I wrote, you know, I wrote a book about the experience that was featured on Haunted Hospitals. A lot of people assumed that I made all this money because the story was featured on Haunted Hospitals. I think maybe this pushed 200 book sales, which is a lot for a self-published author, but it's not like I was making New York Times bestseller or USA Today bestseller. And it's not like I made a lot of money from that at all. Um, it's, it's, and again, I came from that world. I was actually, um, I was actually a, a child actor in TV before I went into theater in Southern California. Yes, I have seen Quiet on the Set, if anyone's wondering. And yes, it brought back a lot of trauma, <laughs> traumatic memories. Um, and uh, But I also was like, not everyone already knew this was happening. But um, so I came from that world. So I knew like what the ROI at a young age, I knew what that looked like for being an extra or having one line in a TV show. Like I knew what that ROI looked like. And um, then I moved in the theater. And again, you don't do theater to make money. It's, you know, this whole starving actor thing. It's not, it's the not passion. a joke. It's a passion. It's a passion. Um, there's a reason why I'm in corporate America now and I'm not still doing professional theater. I can, but I'm doing professional theater in the evening, um, you know, after work. But um, yeah, and I've had, I know people who have gotten t major TV opportunities and then they quit their jobs they do the show and then the show gets canceled or it doesn't get renewed for another season and they can't go back to their previous jobs. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because then now they have to do these paranormal events to make up for um, that loss of income. And uh, I mean, I'm friends with a couple of people who are on a couple of newer shows and they told, cause I asked, I said, cause at the time I was also being, vetted i guess for a potential show um and they weren't they were very they were very muddy on compensation and um so i asked my friends who did who were on these bigger shows i'm like can you just kind of level set with me how much did you make like how much per episode and i was a bit horrified with what i saw and i and i know why reality tv is so popular it's cheap it's very cheap to produce yeah. And ghost hunting shows are even cheaper. They're even cheaper to produce. So, um, and that's a big thing. Like I'll tell producers now, it, you know, when they want to talk to me and stuff and they're like, oh, let's try a vet a TV show. I'm like, well, great. This is how I'm, this is how much I'm making at my day job. Can you match that? Right. <laughs> they can't. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a thing. Like we've, this topic has come up before with uh, like a lot of ghost hunters, they, they argue back and forth. They're like, should they charge? Shouldn't they charge? Is it wrong to charge? And I've always had this philosophy that if I reach out to somebody, if I reach out because I want to go somewhere, then mm -hmm. everything's on me. Yep. You know? And if, if a location reaches out to me and says, hey, we want you to come here, then I'm okay with that. But now it's on you. You know, yep. like get me there. Um, I'll gladly show up. Um, and if it's local, if it's local, it's not a big deal. I don't, I don't care. I'll drive for an hour or two to get somewhere and nothing, you know, I don't care. But if it's like six hours away or I need to take a plane, then yeah, you need to cover expenses. Yep. Um, and yeah. I think there's a big difference when it comes to, I don't, I don't want to sound weird on this, but professional services rather than just like an amateur team, you know, when yep. you have your hobbyists. I don't think they should charge because they don't do it professionally. They they don't have any qualifications for it, and they're doing it more to have fun. Um, yep. And they're not collecting any data. They're not actually 
doing investigation. And I know that some people are going to take that as mean, but you're not. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're not investigating. You are anomaly hunting and, and you're looking for thrills. Um, so I don't think you should be able to charge for that. Uh, right. But yeah, otherwise, like if you're doing professional services, if someone, if a production crew reaches out to you and says, we're interested in your story, we want you to come out to LA and do an interview, then yeah, it should be up to them to get you there. Yep. <clears throat> um, so talking about like <laughs> money making endeavors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love segue. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> you like how I did that? Um, so recently, uh, well, I mean, actually it started like what, five, six months ago. Something like um, that. Yeah. There was a little controversy with the paranormal community, um, a uh, little YouTube channel called Sam and Colby, <laughs> uh, went to the conjuring house and <clears throat> they filmed, uh, two people doing this alleged communication session uh with some knocks and you know the alphabet which to be honest like if i never hear the alphabet said out loud again i'm fine with that i'm, I'm just fine with that after watching all the videos i i <laughs> hear you i hear you 100 on mm-hmm. that and i used to be a preschool teacher so that tells you something yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean it, there, there was there was I mean, everyone in the chat room probably heard about this. Um, uh, uh, Cody and Satori, they're a, they're a, a couple, <clears throat> and they work at the they still work at the Conjuring House, and they were presenting this this method of communication where they, as long as they're touching, uh, one of them recites the alphabet, and the other one, uh, I'm sorry, mysterious knocks suddenly happen <laughs> that are maybe not caused by the other person, but really are. Um, and it makes it stop and they pretty much do the Fox sisters thing. And, uh, so the video came out and then like so many people got pissed off because it was very obvious that, um, something was going on here and then Mm -hmm. more videos came out and it was pointing towards one of them cracking some toe knuckles. Um, and then more videos came out and it was more confirming and and really showing this, uh, And, and then, you know, like they went dark. Uh, they've been dark for a while. The occasional uh, uh, announcement on social media here and there. But recently, the owner of the Conjuring House came out. She posted a, a long um, official announcement or response to all the debunkers and skeptics, which I guess that's me. <laughs> um, I really haven't touched much on it. I, I, I've given my opinion. Um, but uh, it really has nothing to do with the conjuring house. I mean, my opinion has been on, on the, the, the alleged ability itself. Um, mm-hmm. but I saw that you had commented and you brought up some good points and then it looks like some of your comments were deleted. One, at least one comment was deleted, mm-hmm. um, suggesting something. So I figured, you know, since I'm seeing a lot of, uh, well-known YouTubers like, uh, Beardo, um, uh, Mythos. Uh, bad to the bone and stuff like th- th- these guys that have been covering it for a while, you know, now they're responding and they're picking it up. So I want you to come on and, and just talk a little bit about what you think of it, what we think of it. And maybe just give me your thoughts. Like what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So uh, I remembered when all of this started with Sam and Colby, I watched it on Sam and Colby and I was like, Nah, seems too good to be true. And my motto has always been, if it's too good to be true, it usually is. And uh, ironically, I had just gotten done writing my book, Women of the Paranormal, where I did feature the Fox sisters and uh, did a really no head first deep dive into the Fox sisters, like to the point where I knew their bathroom schedule, like by the time I was done. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I was like, this is oddly familiar and then I think what really sealed that, well, what, where I started speaking out more about it, at least in my private Facebook group, was when they were on Project Fear with Dakota Layden. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that episode, I noticed a couple things. And I think it was Mythos or Beardo that actually did a really good job of summarizing that of, you know, when Satori would go through the alphabet and then Cody corrected her on where the crap happened. 
I thought that was a little weird. I was like, why, well, how would he know? How would right. he know? Um, and then there were, or there were times where she would look right at him going through the alphabet. And I thought that was weird too. Um, and then they did that Q and A and it was actually that Q and A that Dakota did with them that where I actually did speak out in my private Facebook group. And I said, Hey, I don't know if y'all are familiar with this. Here's kind of the context. I'm not exactly convinced and I'm really concerned that this may not be legit. And um, I did have a now former friend who was a big Cody and Satori fan. And she just ripped me the shred saying I was bullying. I was attacking them. I was encouraging my group members to attack them as well. And I said, OK, where did I encourage an attack? I mean, yes, I may have candidly said that I'm not convinced, but that I mean, it's true. That's my opinion. I'm not convinced. You know, they don't. Have, and she's like, well, you're telling them that they have to prove something to you. And I'm like, they Technically don't. I mean, they don't have to prove anything to me, but I can still express this in a private group setting. And right. it kind of exploded from there. A friend of so hers. I, I want to, I want to inject uh, here just, just to say like the comment on that. I, I, I really, I do get annoyed when <clears throat> the tables are turned and different rules that apply. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically like you can have one group of people that will, freely express their opinion and mm -hmm. many times express that as fact and want you to believe them face value they don't have to show you anything you just believe them because that's what they're saying yep. and then the moment you challenge that the moment you question it you become a bully you yep. become a hater you become uh, you're attacking them even though you're doing exactly the same thing you're expressing your opinion and in most times and this is this is what I, I like and enjoy about reading when you when you challenge stuff like this, when I read your post that you you back it up, you explain yourself in detail. You don't just put it out there and saying, basically, this is what I say. So therefore, mm -hmm. my word is law. <clears throat> you explain yourself. You give supporting data or evidence to the fact uh, or, or to the point that you're making. And and, and that's the that's part of it. I mean, part of science is putting out your results and waiting for peer review. And part yeah. of that, yeah, roll up your sleeves because it's like it's time to like you're going to have criticism. People are going to critique your work. They're going to point out the flaws. They're going to say, hey, you did this wrong. You, we, we think you can do it better or you should have done it this way. That's part of it. You know, nobody yeah. gets butt hurt. Nobody, you know, puts the bib on and sits in the corner and starts crying about anything like that. And instead, they go to work. Yeah. They either support, they, they argue in support of uh, their, their side and say, this is the evidence that I have. Here's additional evidence. Or they recreate it. So I just, I wanted to bring that out because that just infuriates me when I hear you can express your opinion. Well, no, no. The, the the philosophy is I can express my opinion, but you can't. That's what I hear in these situations. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean no, to interrupt you. But. You're good. You're good. But you bring up a great point because that one person who saw my post and was upset by it, <laughs> screenshotted my thoughts, shared it with their friends, and then their friends attacked me too. And I'm like, this is turning into something way bigger than what it really should, what it Cast away can be, you know. Right. Um, so after I saw that, I was like, you know what? It's not worth comment further commenting on Cody and Satori. So I put it to bed. I actually was like, you know what? I'm just gonna let it be. And then I saw that post on the Conjuring page, <laughs> and I was like, Alex has re-entered the chat. <laughs> like, um. I mean, there's a lot of holes in, there was a lot of gaps in that statement too. And I put my comments in there. I said, you know, this is really unnecessary. I mean, if there's bullying and threats happening, absolutely. That is not acceptable. Right. I think 99.99999% of the skeptical debunking paranormal curious community, we can all agree on that. That is unacceptable. However, their baseline for what is bullying, I do question right that's yeah. the that's the problem like what's what is bully like if someone's coming to your page and constantly posting you're an asshole you suck 
you're fake, you're this and that, then yeah, I, I definitely would consider that bullying. And, and I would say block them, you know, just get it, be done with it. Yep. You know, that's it. Move on. But yeah. but this this is an extraordinary claim. This is a mm -hmm. very extraordinary claim um, where they the, the two the two people involved, um, Cody and Satori, are claiming that when they touch, they can get this connection to the afterlife and yep. communicate. That's that's world Amazing. paradigm shifting shifting. I mean, it, it's just a, a completely new perspective on life. Um, so if that's true, then yeah, they should be, I, I think they should be willing to be tested. Um, yeah. And, and because, because they're promoting it as something that's true and yeah. they're putting it on social media, making sure that, you know, big channels will, will put it out there because, you know, as much exposure as possible. Um, and it, I mean, it not only it boosts, it boosts uh, attention to them. It boosts attention to the Conjuring House itself. Yeah. So yeah, um, people are paying a lot of money, a lot of a money lot. to go to the Conjuring House, and I, I would be completely surprised if no one was interested in seeing this demonstration. That no one going there, you know, they're paying. $1,200 or something to stay there for a night. I would be surprised if any of them said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to see that demonstration. We're just right. here for the house. That's all. Um, I would call bullshit on that first. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's bringing in money to this this cash cow um, of a place. Yep. And I'm, I am suspecting that perhaps the cash cow is depleting a bit, which is why that statement was made. Cause I mean, the original controversy dates back to like five or six months ago and even project fears videos are well over a month old now. Right. So it's like, well, why now? Why not right after project fear released that interview, which that interview did not do Cody and Satori any favors. Oh no, no. It's like, I have to, uh, you know, I'm not a, the biggest fan of bigger paranormal channels, but I do applaud the project fear team for, exposing some of the gaps of, or the questions we all had, like, you know, saying with Satori saying that she came up with the method and then it goes back to Cody doing it years before he met her. And I'm like, right. Ooh. you know, like for me, it would have made more sense if that statement came out after that, but it didn't. So I'm suspecting that perhaps they are starting to see a shift in the business that's coming in for the conjuring house. Um, right which is why that statement is being made and why, and why Jacqueline is now all of a sudden getting involved when really it was just centered on Cody and Satori for a bit. Right. So, um, and the other thing, and the other thing I shared was, or that I recently shared before we went live tonight was if this truly is real, why would you not want to bring in an unbiased research group to at least baseline this phenomena? Because this could be a game changer for the field of anomalous research and paranormal investigating. Like we could baseline equipment now, like, hey, this is what this could be what you're working off of when, it, when you're detecting something. Because right now, I know how you feel about equipment. Right now, the equipment is, I always say it's detecting changes in the environment. That change in the environment could be a bug. <laughs> it could be the AC going on. You know, that's what the change could be. So, um, so for me, it's like, this is an extraordinary opportunity to study this and research this if it was, if it was real, but right. I, and I proposed a similar thing to Jacqueline. I said, you know, there are so, there were plenty of groups out there, you know, um, center for paranormal research and investigation, CRPI out of Virginia, Robert ba Brad Bradley's group, um, the Rhine research center, you know, they're in Durham. So, I mean, they're not, they're on the East coast. Um, and I, she responded with, I don't want a half-baked group coming in with a biased opinion. I want to contact places like Harvard. And, you know, she was naming off these Ivy League schools. And I'm like, one, they're not going to be interested. But I was like, okay, well, since you mentioned that, University of Virginia has the Division of Perceptual Studies. So they're, they could be one you could talk to. And she poo-pooed that too. So I'm like, okay, so you can't – so you're showing a bias in who you want to bring in think, and you want like a, testing the methodology has to be unbiased. Bringing in people that you like is not unbiased. 
<laughs> yeah. Because uh, I also commented, I also put up a post and uh, and offered uh, my own challenge. Well, I offered the, the CFI IG challenge, which is a challenge for my organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's $500,000 prize for anyone that can prove that they have some kind of paranormal abilities. And I also added that if they agreed to take the test, they take the test and pass the preliminary test, then I'll cover their travel expenses. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, that's basically a free trip to LA and you get to prove to the world that you can do this trick. (laughs) You can do this ability and you get 500,000 plus a little bit more dollars Mm -hmm. um, in your bank account. And again, like I always say this too, if you don't want the money, if it's not about the money, I can recommend quite a few charities that you can donate that money to that can desperately use that money. So if it's not about the money, then do it for, you know, cancer treatment, stuff like that. You know, kids with cancer, stuff like, you know, there's always a good cause you can do it for. But I mean, if you're if you're willing to do a scientific study on it, a scientific test, then, yeah, you need you need science. You need scientists to actually do this. Um, And I would always promote having magicians there as well, um, especially under these circumstances. But they're not willing to do this. I don't think they're willing. And I did I did talk to Jason um, and and Jason and I are friends. We're really good friends. um, And I have mentioned it to him. And he's he's said like I he's encouraged them to take me up on the challenge. So I'm hoping that they will. I'm not holding my breath because I don't think they will. Because, I, I mean, my opinion is Cody knows what he's doing. Um, and I've seen that. I've seen that in, in the interviews that he's done, especially with that Project Fear interview. I mean, that boy was sweating. Um, on oh, some yeah, of the was. It, when the, some of the cut scenes, like, he goes from, like, sweating, like, very glossy forehead to okay um, afterwards. And I was like, that guy's sweating. And he also has a tell. Um, there's a tell when he's very nervous. He does a certain movement um, that I noticed over and over again. And uh, I, I don't. I know he's not going to do it because that would expose him. Yeah. Um, but I'm hopeful. I want to be hopeful. I, I know I sound very, very skeptical, very doubtful because um, I am. But the offer still stands. Like it's, it's still there. I'll cover it as long as they go out and pass that preliminary test. Yep. So, yeah, and and I think that's something that Jacqueline also and Cody and Story need to understand is we would love nothing more than to than to find out that this is legit. We would I be would thrilled. Love we would be thrilled. Like the mission's not to. I mean, yes, we debunk, but it's like, but the our the mission statement of I think for most of us is we're not going to look at the sky and say that's green. You know, like if the sky is blue, the sky is blue. If the facts are the facts, then we'll acknowledge it. Right. So, but it's so a different I, I want to comment. Like I, I know like skeptics and debunkers were all pulled together in that, that particular post. Um, and I don't ever, I don't really consider myself a debunker. Um, I don't like going in like that because that to me, that presents a bias. That mm-hmm. presents an attitude like I'm going in there just to prove you wrong. Yep. Um, what I try to do is solve a mystery. That's what I'm trying to do. What, whatever the conclusion is based on the data, that's what I'm going with. Uh, unless I get more information that changes it, which is fine. That's how science works. But I don't go in with the intention of, of debunking something. It's just that's the result of the investigation most of the time. Um, in this case... There is an overwhelming amount of data to look at and come to a preliminary conclusion that, okay, this is most likely the cause. Exhibit A, B, C, D, all the way to double A, (laughs) double B. You know, like there's a lot of evidence against uh, this being something real. Um, And I I think if they are... I think you mentioned it earlier. Like they really have no obligation. They don't have to prove it to anyone. No. I mean, they can say no, you know, that's fine. But I also think that if they are, if if there's any money being exchanged whatsoever, 
which that doesn't mean just to them personally, but if people are paying to go to a house and then they are on staff and they are performing this, there is money coming in because of this, uh, this, this trick. So I think if that's the case, then it should be, it should be proven. It should be attempted to be proven or else, you know, like that's, that's taking money for false claims. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, that's not, that's a no, no. Um, that's, that's a big no, no. <laughs> that's a big no, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, I think part of the reason for the big, and if every, anyone watching, if you haven't seen the like official response, you, uh, feel free go to the conjuring house, uh, Facebook page. It's on there. You can read it all. Please don't leave them. hate. don't, yeah. don't leave any hateful comments. Just read it. Um, if you're going to comment, I encourage you, please just be respectful with it, but read it and you'll see. I, I think some of it has to do with frustration and anger because of what you mentioned earlier. Maybe, maybe their, their sales are being affected by this, you know? And if so, then, you know, that's more encouragement to say, Hey, go get tested. Show all these people, show all of these doubters. It's real. Yeah, exactly. Um, there was a, I, and I sent you the screenshots. I think that comment got deleted because I can't find it anymore, but there, there was someone who commented on that saying that they were a PhD scientist slash ge geologist who's a non-believer, but they believe in the method. Oh my God, side eye guy, I'm geeking out. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Hang on. I got to calm down a little bit. <laughs> you, you need a drink? Big fan. I'm actually waiting for my husband to bring a refill, but uh, <laughs> holy cow. Ge geeking it's out. Done. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. That, that's how you can get me to stop in my tracks. <laughs> Hang on. I'm getting my refill of mead. Um, awesome. But... Uh, <laughs> Oh my God. Anyway, so I looked at her comment and um, she was like, oh, I can say for certain that they are real. And I did background check this, this person and she does have a PhD, um, but it's like e ecological, like science, environmental science type of thing. But one comment that she made that stood out to me was, uh, I also have on multiple occasions offered Cody and Satori sums of money just because I've been so grateful to be in the room with them. They have always refused. I wish they would accept money. They would be millionaires. Wow. And I'm like, that's weird. That's a very one fangirl comment. My friend Tara had mentioned that too. Um, but, and this very much read, and then someone found out that this woman has also given letters of recommendation for Jacqueline and other situations. So I was like, ooh, okay. So it was very much a friend trying to vouch. Yeah. Like, and I almost played in my head of like, Jacqueline was like, you have a PhD. Can you comment on that post? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and I commented with, oh, that's great. I would love to see the conditions you tested them in. I would love to read your paper or even your abstract. That. I saw that. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's, uh, that's speaking out of your area of expertise. Um, honestly, like, yeah, if you have a PhD, that's great. But if it's in a field completely unrelated to what we're dealing with, then your opinion is just as valid as anyone else's. Um, I mean, I can get a PhD in theater, <laughs> you know, right, <laughs> that right. doesn't make me qualified to comment on that it's it's not i mean it's great it's great that you that they went to school for that and they they train they earn that i mean because it's definitely something that you need to earn and i i'm totally on board with it and i congratulate them but again if you're speaking outside of your expertise then you are speaking outside of your expertise mm -hmm. uh, and and you it doesn't matter i don't give a shit if you're a phd or whatever letters you got behind your name it doesn't right. matter um let me see the data. And just as you posted, because I, I watched, I read that. I was like, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> but yes, yeah, show me the data. Show me the, the, the evidence. Show me the testing. Where were you published? You know, where, what do you have to show me that this is real? Mm -hmm. Except that you're just saying it is. It, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Um, mm -hmm. whew, this is, this has been fun. Um, so we have we have about five minutes 
You want to go to break now? Yeah, we probably should get a break. All right, so let's go to break. And then when we come back, um, we can start taking some questions. I know we have some in the queue, but I do want to talk a little bit about your book, uh, the last book that you put out, because um, I, I, have, I have some questions and I want to, I want to get your opinion on, on some things because I don't know. And I'll keep you in suspense with that. <laughs> we'll go to break. We have about four minutes and 11 seconds for our commercial slash pee break. <laughs> so I'll see you in four minutes from now. I rock out to that. I love that. <laughs> mm. I wanted to show everyone before we uh, 
continue on that um, Side Eye Guy did a recent video and I was surprised with um, uh, there was artwork that was put up on screen and it was like a caricature of a whole bunch of the the people in the debunking community. I saw that. And I printed it out <laughs> because because that's there me. You are. <laughs> nice. I was so happy. Look at this. This is beautiful. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people in there. Um, and I was like, this is really cool. And I, I looked at it first and I was like, oh, can I, that's cool. Like I looked in the center. I was like, oh, I see Side Eye Guy. I know uh, Crow of Judas. I see, I see Beardo. I see mm -hmm. Mythos. I was like, oh, cool, cool. And then it came on a second time and I was like looking around the edges. I'm like, wait. And I paused it. I was like, hey, Donna, <laughs> is that me? <laughs> is that, I don't, I don't know. And I actually reached out to Side Eye Guy and was like, is that me? And he sent me the sketch of all the names. I'm like, it is me. That's so that's awesome. That's so cool. That is so uh, cool. Congrats. Thank you. That, that, that was really cool. That made my day. It makes me want to grow a beard back because, yeah, I have a beard in it. Of course, I look like an old man. I actually look like a boy with a, with a beard. With a beard. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you, before we get to the questions, I want to touch on your book, your last book, uh, Women in the Paranormal. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> you, well, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about it, so I was like, I'll just grab it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Women in the Paranormal features 38 women throughout paranormal history, some awesome, some maybe questionable, um, but really, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some really cool women in the field who helped shape our field the way that it is today, um, who made contributions, who may have forced us to up our research game, you know? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's 38 women, and it's 38 because I couldn't come up with a clean number. Um, <laughs> there is going to be a volume two, which ideally will be out this year sometime. Um, and then probably a volume three and four, just because I keep finding names and my pile keeps getting higher. And the more that I research these women, I'm like, oh, that's a cool story. Or, huh, okay, okay they were frauds, but they managed to convince a lot of really smart men that they were legit, which I thought was amusing. Um, <laughs> Florence Cook. Um, <laughs> you uh, know. Yes. Florence yes. Cook is going to be in volume two. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I, so I do have some female parapsychologists as well. Um, I have Thelma Moss, Gertrude Schmeidler. Um, you know, what's I have, you know, let's got to look at the table of contents. Um, <laughs> Sarah Wilson Estep, Lu Luisa Rhine, um, Rose Mackenberg, you know. Oh, um, yes, I have her, I have a poster of her big newspaper newspaper spread um, exposing weird secrets of mediums and uh, spirits. So it's up on my wall. It's a huge poster. It's all her disguises and all that stuff. I love Rose yeah. Mackenberg. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, Eleanor Sidgwick, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Florence Barrett. So I do have, um, so parapsychologists, scientific women in the series. I also have a lot of mediums, um, cause mediums were also, well, at least the spiritualism era of mediums, a lot of them were involved with like more political aspects, like, um, suffragists, um, abolitionism, um, who did help make some sort of impact around them. Uh, or looking at this from a femin from a feminism analysis, you know, leveraging the privilege that they had as mediums that the traditional woman may not have had. Um, so yeah, it's been it's, so it's actually been really enlightening to write about these women. Um, a lot of them have male contemporaries who were more famous than them, but they may have inadvertently actually like helped these men elevate to their status that they earned uh that, that they received um but yeah so i'm working on volume two um volume two will probably have 30 or 35 women in it um and then volume three and four will be the the rest of them hopefully um yeah so the, this i wanted to talk about this because i had questions um because i mean and and donna and i were talking about this earlier over dinner it's like the, the paranormal community is, I, I would argue, 
a dominated by white male. Um, like it's a white male dominated hobby. Um, mm -hmm. And I know I say hobby and I know you say field. And it, we, I use them interchangeably because I don't mm -hmm. think everyone actually treats it as a field. Um, but mm -hmm. do, do, do you see it that way? That's a good question. I mean, I'm not making money from this really. It's, you know, I, I make a little bit from my books and any monetization I do on YouTube and TikTok, but this doesn't quit my job money. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I, I call it the field, but I can also see where it is a hobby, but I think, and I get into this with people all the time of like, where is the break? Where, where does it deviate from? Like, like who's a paranormal researcher? Who's a paranormal investigator? Who's a ghost hunter? Who's an enthusiast? You know, that's like, where do these lot, where do the swim lanes stand? I, I always see it as like, um, if they are self-styled names, they're, they're given. Most of these are not bestowed onto people. They are given by themselves. Yeah. That's a good know, point. Uh, so when I hear like, and, and I hear reasoning sometimes, like I'm not a ghost hunter, I'm a paranormal investigator. And it's like, what's the difference? Tell me what the difference is. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be like, ha ha, I'm going to catch you on something. I want to know, like, what do you think is the difference? Right. You know, yeah. you tell me what the difference is. And usually they can't. Um, but yeah, this title from, from my experience. And even when I was a, I was a ghost hunter. And I gave myself that that name. And then I graduated to Paranormal Investigator because it sounded better. Not that I did anything different. It's just yep. I wanted to sound more important. Um, but actually, what what I was my my question was actually not for that. But it was actually about the male, the white male dominated hobby. Oh. Like, do you do you see it that way, too? And if so, like, why? Why is there not as many? women or i don't know if i'm going to say this right people of color um yeah involved yeah. in this okay I'm, ne uh, I'm never sure what i'm allowed to say anymore <laughs> I'm, I'm the bad guy i'm the old white guy <laughs> so i'm like uh, what do i say i don't know if I, uh, all right so there's my question what all right think? let's open up this box um oh. okay so <sighs> There's different lenses in which how the paranormal community, and I guess we can even say paranormal media space is viewed and has been for years. There are women in the field. There Sometimes I would even almost argue that there are more women in the field than men. However, men tend to get platformed more often. This is, at least in our modern time, especially in the media space with TV, uh, we don't have a female equivalent of Zach Bagans. Zach also does not. <laughs> That's I, a good thing. <laughs> it is. But, but at the same time, like, is it though? Like, but we don't have that equivalent, but we also like Zach's team doesn't have, hasn't had women on his team, on his investigation team. Right. Um, a lot of the TV shows, um, even with ghost hunters with grant's version and jason's version um very minimum on women and then when they do have the women they all look the same and that's the hollywood thing that's the la thing coming through um but yeah so but when i take a landscape of the community it is mainly female dominated um and then when i do my own analytics on my website and on tiktok and youtube i look at the demographics and that's very heavy on women um, and then when I see these shows that come out, I mean, repossessed on Hulu, you had two women and one male on that show, but yet the male was still the star. And then the two women were the supporting roles. Um, oftentimes women, at least in media are pinned as the, as the medium, uh, the historian, you rarely often see a woman positioned as the tech or even the lead investigator. Um, so and then whatever is happening in the media space gets reflected in the events. Um, there is, there are a couple of bigger events that I see that it's very male dominated. And I, I get in trouble sometimes when I point that out, I say, Hey, I'm noticing you have like 30 men and five women. Right. That's, that seems a little uneven, <laughs> you know, it seems a little uneven. And even with like, I can stick my foot in my mouth with this. 
the Warren's Paracon. You had the Warren's Paracon, which was created based from a male, a, a couple, man, woman duo. And yet the guest list for the Warren's Paracon is extraordinarily heavily on men. And I find that very ironic because hmm. Lorraine was the other half of that and also carried on that legacy after Ed died. And why can't, why don't we, why doesn't whoever's in charge of planning, not going to pin it on in one person, but it's like, why is that? Um, but it's always been that way though. Like even with the ghost club back in 1800s, London, that, that club did not allow women for quite some time, but then you had the society for cycle research coming in with Eleanor Sidgwick as a co-founder. So I think SPR was almost like a, almost like a rebellious group, so to speak, because I learned that SPR from writing women of the paranormal SPR was almost a safe haven for marginalized groups at the time, which was surprising for me. Cause I had always seen SPR as like this group of like not stuffed up scientists, but it's like, you know, almost like another boys club. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm seeing like, Oh, Eleanor Sidgwick was a co-founder. Oh, she carried SPR. Oh, okay. You know, and then I'm seeing like who the main investigators were, the, who the main researchers were, and I'm running into more women, but yet they're not platformed as much, even with SPR. I mean, SPR did become more inclusive compared to like other orgs at the time, but there was still like this platforming of men over female. And I think that is the result of a, patriarchal society that is very dominant it's still to this day um but yeah it's uh it's a little frustrating but that's that's actually why i wrote women of the paranormal because i'm like i feel like women were way more involved than i mean i read night side of nature as one of the first books i ever read in like about poltergeist you know i did a search in my library library card for poltergeist and night side of nature came up and i looked at Catherine crow and i'm like oh okay cool but it wasn't until about five or six years ago I realized like how how much these women's legacies are buried, and even to, even to this day, how often they're still buried. I mean, if you look at the the Doris Bither case with you know that the entity was based on, you know, it's a lot of it is um, um, Barry Taft, and you know, getting a lot of the accolades and the credit for it. But Thelma Moss was his boss. So, but you rarely see her name included when that story is retold. So, um, and she ran the parapsychology department at UCLA. So, so I, I, I can comment in, in this a little bit um, because the, the UCLA did not have a parapsychology unit. That was a um, separate, like after, after school curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't an official um, and that's from UCLA. It was not an official department. Um, so it was like more of a club. She had, there was a building where staff or, uh, uh, what do you call it? What do you call teachers? Teacher staff. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I, know teacher, I know what we're doing. Uh, yeah. Uh, faculty, uh, faculty mm -hmm. could use, um, for other, uh, like little clubs, uh, like unofficial clubs. And that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and as, as far as I read, like, she, I didn't, I didn't think she was actually involved in the investigation itself. It was more consulting, but I, I could be wrong on that. I mean, my main point was that UCLA did not have a parapsychology department, um, mm -hmm. but, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to defend Taft because I don't think Taft did a great job at all, or even a good job. Um, I, I don't like how he handled it, um, or uh, uh, Gaynor, Gaynor, was yeah, Gaynor? yeah, Carrie Gaynor, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't like how either of them handled it, um, but that's yeah. just my opinion. But I, I, I mean, agree. yeah, I mean, did she did she actually get involved in the investigation? She did. There is there is a little bit um, that I read that she was involved in at least the beginning part of the investigation, and then she did move into a more consultative role. Okay. But I mean, she was still involved in some sort right. of way. But her um, but her name is often you know not even mentioned in the narrative. Um, yeah. So that one that one is um, 
Yeah. So I misspoke there. Not parapsychology department, but parapsychology lab. That's it, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I get it because, like, I, I know Taft has has gone on interviews and talked about it. And I mean, to be honest, from my perspective, he's tried to push it off as it was a parapsychology department that was like an official mm -hmm. department when it wasn't. Um, yeah. And that, that's always bothered me um, because I, I think that's misrepresenting what he was doing um, mm -hmm. aside from, you know, other problems with the, uh, the entire investigation, but that's another, that's a story that's for a another story. show. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you, you're, you're, you're looking at your demographics and you're looking at your data and you're saying that, this is more of a, a female dominated um, community. Is that it? Cause that that's interesting to me. Uh, Cause I, I didn't, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. Well, you know, it really depends also like what we're looking at is what would be dominating. Are we talking like population? Or are we going to talk contribution? Cause that's where it gets a little, that's where you're right. You're right. That's where it gets muddy. Um, you know, I still have people debating about Catherine Crow, you know, at least from what I have, Catherine Crow conducted what could be the earliest paranormal investigation, a paranormal investigation as we know it today. Um, but then some of the counter arguments I will get is, well, what about exorcisms? And I'm like, well, that's not a paranormal investigation necessarily. That's a religious. Right. Yeah. Ritual. That's a religious ritual. That's a ritual. Yeah. Um, or this someone then brings up Athena Doris. Well, what about Athena Doris? Was he not doing a paranormal investigation? <laughs> if, if Athena Doris was real, or at least if that situation was real, because um, that is a story from Pliny the Younger. <laughs> so uh, yeah. is that more of a metaphor? Was that more of a teaching of a lesson that was trying to be bestowed? Um, so, but with Catherine Crow, I mean, granted, the documentation we have is her documentation. Um, because I, I did do some fact checking. I'm like, okay, can I find this? Can I find this investigation anywhere else? And I couldn't. But even if it wasn't, it didn't happen. She still descri oddly described what we would do today in a paranormal investigation. So it's like, well, you know, there's something, there's something to that still. Okay. Um, but yeah. So in terms of the demographic today, I would say, especially if we look at audience demographics for ghost hunting shows, it is very, it's very heavy on women. Um, I actually, I know more women who are psychic mediums and witches and historians that I know who are like active paranormal investigators. So I will say that. Um, but I think that's also a reflection of what we're being fed by, you know, the media, you know, with um, between documentaries, books and stuff. It's always tends to be a male that takes the lead with that. Um, <clears throat> I have found some interest. I did find some really interesting uh, women of color for volume two who um, who were part of paranormal investigation and research that I was like, I did not know you exist. I'm so glad I found you. Um, <laughs> cool. um, but I mean, even speaking of women of color, you know, I found Iko Gibo, um, for volume one. And it turns out that she was the one who believed that she had made contact with a little girl named Annie at Mary King's close. And it's from that encounter that Aiko Gibo, she is the reason why people bring dolls to that ghost at Mary King's Close now. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do some more digging. And she actually did do daily segments um, on, a, on, a, on a talk show of paranormal investigating. And Kenny, I kid you not, I mean, I'll send you the videos too. The way, she, the way these are filmed, they're oddly similar to what we see in ghost hunting shows today. And this is from like the 70s and 80s. And I'm like, hmm, hmm, this is interesting. Like it was almost like I would not have been surprised if like Nick or Zach had watched that and were like, hey, let's emulate that because it was very, it's very popular. Um, it was very popular in Japan. So and I'm like, that makes all the sense because Japanese media is a completely different genre from, you know, TV as we really know it as like talk shows and that sort of thing. And I'm like, holy cow, ghost hunting shows. It's, it's, it's Jap it's Japanese programming. It totally, that's what it is. <laughs> and it made sense to me after that. I'm like, oh, that's what they're emulating. <laughs> so, but the fact that Aiko Gibo more than likely probably played a significant role in that is interesting. Um, and at least with the Mary King's close contribution, I mean, it's like, yeah, she should get a shout out. And when I did to be scariest places in the world, and I was talking about Mary King's close, 
I said Iko Giba's name at least six times when I was talking about the story of Annie. I made sure that I got her name in. And then sure enough, when the final thing came out, they used somebody else's interview for that part and said, oh, a psychic found this ghost. Oh. And then they showed, but they showed Iko Gibo's picture. And I just went, oh. yeah. so close. So <laughs> close. Just say her name. Please just say her name. Because right. whether or not it's legit or not, like that is something, uh, that's a major story. That's a major part of Mary King's close lore now. And it's like she deserves that recognition at the very least, um, or that that yeah recognition or acknowledgement. But um, yeah, a lot of times when I was reading the when I was writing and reading research material, I thought, why don't we know more about this about this person? Um, I mean, I'm running into it right now with um, Tony Wolf and Carl Young. You know, um. I'm reading a lot. And of course I see what the Vampira museum did to Tony's story. And I was like, no. Um, so it's, it's a lot, a, a lot of times I'm often saying as I'm writing these books, Holy cow, why didn't I know you before? Why didn't I know you sooner? Right. Right. So, and you get drawn in, right? I mean, when you research these people, I, I, like whenever I do research and, and like the last, last like three days I've been deep dive um into a particular location and i'm learning about a family and i'm just just learning about their lives what they did what they uh, experienced what they um uh, tried to do and whether they've passed or failed you know like just living their lives through the records i love that i i love digging into that and learning about people and i feel the, the same passion that you do i want to tell the world about them um yeah. rose mackenberg is one of my idols it, it, she really is. She she is an unsung hero of of what I do. Um, she yep. did lay legwork. She paved the way for Houdini to showcase um, fake mediums. She did show what they did, and she got so little credit for it. Um, and and I mean, it's it, it's it's sad. Like the end of her life, she she passed away alone. Um, but like she made such a big contribution to what people like me do yep. here. And I, I look at her and, and like I said, like I literally have her poster right in front of me here and, and I look at it every day and I'm like, yeah, that's what I want to, I want to achieve what she is. She achieved already. Mm -hmm. She did yeah. a wonderful job. Um, yeah. So good. All right. So we are, we are, we're pretty good. We're an hour and 20 minutes. You want to start doing some questions? Sweet. Oh, we got a bunch of questions. It looks like. Uh -oh. oh boy, this might be a three-hour show. No. Oh. I got my husband to give me more mead, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What do we got first? All right. Question: What's your opinion on reincarnations and deja vu? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. I mean, I can go first because uh, it's, it's it. pretty simple. I don't. I do not maintain an idea that reincarnation is is real. Uh, I know there's plenty of stories. I know there are books about it, and I've read the stories. And there's a lot of missing information, and that's why I'm, I'm hesitant on on putting any kind of thought into it. And I don't have beliefs. I want to. I, I totally avoid that word. Um, but I haven't seen some information that's missing. Like before the researchers got there, there is a lot of information missing beforehand as as when it comes to deja vu i mean that's we have so many experiences throughout life that yes you're going to have multiple experiences of the same thing um, or similar things so it's going to feel like there is something going on you feel like you've been there before um but also i've come across this is an odd feeling i research so much stuff that Every time I get a chance to look at like walkthrough videos or pictures from a place, I will do so. And I have found that years later, when I finally get to visit the place, I walk up going, I feel like I've been here before. I feel like I've been here. I feel like I've walked through. I think I know where what's around this corner. And I do. And then it takes like a little bit. I'll, I'll be in a chair. It's like one o'clock in the morning. You know, everyone's trying to go to sleep. And I'm like, Oh wait, 
I watched a walkthrough video like 17 years ago. That's when I saw this place. That's how I know it is mm -hmm. because it always bugs me. Like that really bugs me when I have that kind of feeling. Um, but I usually find an explanation for it. So I don't, I don't buy into either reincarnation or deja vu. So what's your, what's your take? Ah, reincarnation for me is very tricky. Um, I get skeptical when it's coming, when it's a story coming from children. Um, because I mean, I worked with kids before. I mean, right after grad school, I was working in elementary school and, um, and I, then I became a preschool teacher and I learned how impressionable kids can be and also how willing to please their parents' kids can be too. And then when I was doing uh, residential cases, you know, I always made sure to look for clues of like, are the kids being coached by their parents? I mean, the, with the biggest telltale, there's a lot of signs, but the biggest telltale signs is when the kid keeps looking at their parent because um, they're looking for that confirmation, that reinsurance. Very similar to how Satori looks at Cody. Um, anyway, <laughs> to bring it back. Um, uh, but um, I do have one friend who has a very compelling reincarnation case. Um, and she's documented it. She, um, with medical records and different things to correlate her past life with her, pre with her current life that I, I think is interesting. Um and so that one, she so not saying that I completely believe it, but that's the one I'm like, hmm, that is interesting. Okay, I, when I have, and all the time I have, it's like I want to dig deeper on this case because um, I do think there could be something there. But um, deja vu, I struggle with deja vu because it happens to me a lot. And usually it's because I feel, I think I can, I can trace it back to a dream that I had. Um, and it, it, it has made me start, um, journaling, dream journaling. And a lot of times it's just like a picture I see where like, this could be a perfect example of, oh, I'm wearing a plaid shirt. I got my hair down, my cat's in the background and my, and I can see my glass of mead. I've been here before. I feel like I dreamt this before, but I know there's like scientific explanations about that, but I started um, dream journaling and starting to trace what I see. So, but then it's like, but then when I get the deja vu and I'm like, oh, did I journal it? I don't remember which notebook it's in. So it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you for the question. That was pretty cool. It's a good all one. Right. Let's move on. <laughs> that was good. Redman, what's up? Alex, have you had any training in investigation? Ooh, that's a good question. Okay. So this, let me paint the picture of where my training has come from. Paint the picture, Alex. <laughs> yeah. So initially it started off as, you know, I watched the TV shows at least early. So I can always tell when someone comes into the field based on their investigation technique, because it's like, is this pre 2010 ghost hunters or is this like ghost adventures? Um, <laughs> so I did watch the TV shows, at least like early ghost hunters, like first couple seasons. And I was like, oh, hey, people can actually do this. Interesting. Um, but then it, it spiraled into finding SPR and reading case notes from like 50s and 60s, did a little bit of dive into the Warrens, but even like 14 year old Alex wasn't like completely taken by them, which I guess, thank you 14 thing. year old Alex. Um, so what I did in terms of training, I read a ton of books. Um, I read Hans Holzer. I read um, Proceedings for the Society of Psychical Research. Um, I had that quintessential, really esoteric, quirky librarian at my local library who more than likely was the witch that lived at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, <laughs> and she was like, Oh, you went to ghosts. Let me show you this. You know, it was very cool. like, she was, she was cool. Um, but once I, before I started going into doing residential cases, I actually shadowed a couple of local teams um, to see how they did things. And um, one of them, her, father the director's father was a part of the ghost club but i was like oh okay that's interesting so i kind of learned a little bit from her and honestly the reason the other reason i started my team was because i was also a working actor at the time and i knew my schedule wouldn't vibe with any of these teams so i started my own um because <laughs> then i work for myself but um yeah so in terms of training um i still i mean i 
I never stop learning. So I'm always reading books. I attend webinars with the Association of Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, ASAP, in the UK. Their name is very long. That's why I have to close my eyes and go through it. But I also take classes with the Rhine. I took classes from Lloyd Auerbach. Um, Lloyd is a great mentor. Um, Lloyd has some really good stuff out there, too. So I'm always like, and plus I talk to people, you know, I talk to people who are out there in the field, um, not like the people dressed in all black with their crossed arms and their ghost hunting logo. Hey, 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 rock star poses still rule, <laughs> I hear. <laughs> um, but then also I talk to Kenny too. Like I'll talk to Kenny about things. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll talk to Kenny and get his two cents. I, I'll talk to Brandon Masulo who did study parapsychology while he was working on his psychology master's at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I, so I still talk and bounce ideas off of people. So, um, so my training is less TV and more like books, classes, talking to people, um, bouncing ideas off. Um, or if I really need to like, like I'll send Kenny pictures sometimes and I'm like, Hey, explain this. Like I'm five, you know, <laughs> 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 not pictures, but video and audio. I'll be like, Hey, you know, explain this to me. Like I'm five. Cause I need to debunk this. And I know it's not legit, but I don't know how to articulate it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I do that a lot. I, I do send out stuff or I get opinions from other people. I, I seek out professionals in different areas. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, like I say every show, I don't know everything. Um, yep. And I try, I really try to learn. I, I really, uh, and, and this was actually part of my review. My boss gave me, um, when I don't know something, I just immerse myself in it. Uh, I just yeah. dive headfirst and I want to know everything there is to know about it. And I mean, some of the, a lot of these books I have read behind me and a lot of them are science books, uh, investigative books, um, investigative journalism and, and forensic sciences. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do these things. Um, so I want to know. And, and I mean, I just did it today. I actually did redid my bookshelves because this shelf here and this shelf, all photography manuals. Nice. Um, and I've read every one of them except for the yellow ones because I just got them. But I've read the rest of them. So I do have an extensive, extensive knowledge in photography, which is great. I love it. But I still learn more tricks every day. Yeah. Which is fun. Which is fun. I mean, uh, and and. The investigation process evolved over time for me um, where I, I didn't know what I was doing at first, but then I learned from other investigators, Ben Raffer, Joe Nickel. They were big um, for me. Uh, Sharon Hill. She was, oh, really, Sharon. she was very important um, when, when she had her uh, doubtful news uh, website. I love that. That was just awesome to me because I learned so much from her. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So it, it has evolved over time. Uh, I've never taken, well, I can't say that I haven't taken, I, I've taken certain classes and that was more for diagnosing and repair various things, automotive, aerospace, um, uh, 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 x-ray machines, angio, uh, machines. So I do have a background in diagnosing problems. Uh, and that's what I see mysteries as it's a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then I learned from other people like you, I mean, I go out and, and, like uh, me and Dave, uh, Dave Schumacher, who's in the chat room. I mean, we talk about, uh, and, and, and Tim Vickers, we talk about data collection all the time and how to, how to hook up data loggers, what, what we, what we need in order to get good sample sizes. Um, mm -hmm. and then he's a wealth of information when it comes to that. And I really, really appreciate his help, um, on a lot yeah. of things. So good question, red man. Awesome. Let's see what else we got here. John Kennedy, what's the kitty's name? Oh, that's a kid. quick one. Uh, the kitty that I, I was holding earlier, that's Chloe. And this is Zoe, who, uh, you know. Chloe, Zoe. <laughs> this is Chloe. I have a Chloe, Zoe, Sophie, and then Toa. You so. have four cats. You, yeah, you know I that qualifies you as a cat family. lady. Huh? You're a, cat, you're a total cat lady. That's it, my husband cancels it out. <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> I, I, I really, I don't, I don't, 
I think there's a problem here. <laughs> <laughs> we call this addiction. <laughs> I did. I did foster three kittens earlier this year, this past summer, um, past summer. So last year, um, and I was able to give up two of them. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cats and I do not get along. I'm allergic to them. Oh, okay. It would, it would, it, yeah. As soon as I walk into a house that has cats, like I, my lungs immediately start to close up and I'm like, <gasps> well, if you ever come to DC, we'll hang out outside the apartment. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'll take a lot of, uh, uh, Benadryl <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before I come in. All right. Moving on to the next question. Timothy Binga, what is the legal threshold for fraud in cases like this? Is mm. this an avenue for stopping this sort of is there an avenue for stopping this sort of thing? I think this is from earlier. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this, I mean, uh, I would say like, this is not my department. Mm -hmm. uh, legal is not my department. So I would actually hand that over to somebody else um, yeah. and see if there is. Uh, but I mean, if there, I, I, I imagine if there's a disclaimer somewhere in the, the release that you sign that says for entertainment purposes only, then there's really nothing you can do. Yeah. But that's just my two cents. What do you think? Yeah. So once upon a time, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I did not pursue that, obviously. But um, so from my limited legal knowledge and also just talking with a couple of lawyer friends about this situation in, in particular, um, apparently Jacqueline did go to law school, but I'm not sure if she passed the bar or not. Cause I can't find her name in it with, okay. um, with it, but she said a couple things that like the defamation and the slander threats. Um, there's no way that those are going to hold up in court because one, they would have to prove that Cody and Satori are communicating with spirits, which opens up a whole door of then you have to prove like that ghosts exist. Um, okay. so I think. So, I mean, if Jacqueline ever did practice law, it's been a long time since she looked at it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so but from what point. I know, from what I know, and I know this too from running a team, you know, making sure that we're legally protected is like, for fraud, I mean, it would be easy. Let's just say it would be easier for us to prove fraud in a courtroom with them than they would have to prove defamation and slander. So, um, because we, cause it could be, it could be proven that that sound is coming from a physical object, but, um, but yeah, but, but again, if you put in that buzzword for entertainment purposes only, that does help cloak, um, a bit, a little bit of a safety net there. And that may be something they, they probably are going to have to start considering, uh, given how how much this grows again and Jacqueline's post just kind of reopened everything and now making people think a little harder, which could be a bad thing for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a little late to the game. Um, mm -hmm. I was surprised. Uh, I think you sent it to me first. Um, yeah. and, and I was like, wait, <laughs> I thought we were done with this. <laughs> like, I really thought we were at the tail end. Like, yeah. what are, what are we doing? Why, why are we stirring up shit again? Like, Oh, that was a dumb move. That was just a plain and simple dumb move um, to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Moving on. What else we got there? Uh, Jeff, what's up, buddy? Uh, for both, ever been requested to investigate a home to gather proof uh, for the owner that ghosts caused the damage in a home for an insurance claim? <laughs> Long ago, had seen a person posting wanting help with this on a Facebook group. Wow. Wow. One, I don't think the insurance policy, well, I guess if you could say acts of God, but. Hmm. No, I have never, <laughs> I've never yeah, been asked I don't, I don't, that. <laughs> I don't think they would, I don't think they would cover that. No, I don't think so. I've been asked um, by people to try and get out of, uh, of, of lease. Um, they wanted, mm, I, I actually that. have, I have a, a artifact from that. Um, I have a, a little a toy baby. It's a vintage baby carriage, but it's a like a toy version for a little doll. Um, and there were two guys in an apartment that were trying, trying to get out of the lease. And they claimed that the, the place was haunted. And 
their claim involved this little little baby carriage rolling across the floor by itself. Um, and and I let's put the air quotes on by itself um, because I was called in by the landlord. And when we when when we investigated and it happened, I was told specifically beforehand by the tenants. If you see it down the hallway, don't run down because then it'll disturb it and it'll stop doing whatever it is. So you can't run down to get it. So red flag. <laughs> um, yeah. As soon as it started moving, as soon as because one guy went to bed and we waited up and then the other guy was like, there it is. There it is. And you see it creeping across the hallway from one room to the other. And yeah, I I ran as fast as I could, even though the guy was screaming at me to stop, picked it up. Sure enough, fishing line. Uh, I was attached to it, so they were they were trying to get out of the lease, and needless to say, they did not. Um, <laughs> so that was the case that I I worked on that had that that kind of consequence. But yeah, to get out of insurance claim, that's funny. That's, that's bold too. That's I would love good. to be there for that phone call. <laughs> A ghost did it. <laughs> Uh, a ghost broke my my table. All right, that was a good question. What else we got? Parafam United. Did you all? Did you have also a near death experience, Alex? Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you have any any anything like that? Yeah. So the night of the accident, I don't think it was a near death experience. I feel like it was more of an out of body experience. Um. Because my blood pressure was so low from the fall and internal damage and everything, I was in, I was bleeding internally. They could not give me pain meds. So when they were moving me from the gurney to the table, bed, table, what the trauma room they were working on me on, working on me in, um, it, it pain, the pain was pretty incredible. <laughs> um, sure. Because, yeah. you know, I pretty much broke my pelvis almost in half. And, uh, and of course I had, um, spinal cord injury too. So anytime they were like, you know, taking blood or examining me and, um, they were trying to get my vitals stabilized. Cause that was the problem. Um, what I saw was I could see myself like, like I was floating above and then I could walk around. I, some like through some weird ethereal experience, I found myself being able to walk around the room and also go into the, into the, into the, um, waiting room. And I saw my mom and I saw my friends and a part of me was like, okay, well maybe this is, maybe I am dying because I'm seeing my mom and everybody that I care about. Um, but I also didn't have that warm, fuzzy feeling that people often report with near death experiences. I didn't see a light. Um, so I was like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> all right, whatever this is. And then um, once I was back, so to speak, back in my body, um, the next day, I, the next morning, I did ask my mom, like, you know, who, because I will say, though, where this kind of does, and again, like I said, I do debunk myself. I do try to explain possibly my experiences. Um, I did ask my mom to call my best friend in high school. Yeah. You know, I said, Hey, call Liz. And, um, and probably what happened was my mom called Liz and then probably Liz called our entire social circle and they were all in the, in the waiting room. So about a dozen or so of my friends were in the waiting room and their parents, they were all there to support my mom. So maybe somehow like I kind of like had assumed that, you know, when I was having my own experience, which could explain it. Um, but also, you know, I, I, and I theorized that my pain, the pain I was dealing with was so severe that I checked out. Yeah. 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 She has to shut down at some point. I, yeah. I haven't experienced anything like that. So I, I just have no reference. Um, so I, especially like, like, fuck. You 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 fell off a bridge. <laughs> I mean, holy shit! <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna let you tell your story. <laughs> you fell off a bridge, bridge and pretty much landed on my ass. You know, and you're you're walking around today. Um, so I mean, God damn, that's yeah. You're, you're a tough bitch. <laughs> 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 um, I wouldn't I wouldn't mess with you. 
<laughs> like, hey, don't don't pick a fight with her. She fell off a bridge and walked away. <laughs> uh, shit. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's let's move on. Next question. Uh, is the book also available in other languages, like Dutch? Unfortunately, no. Um, I am in talks with a parapsychology group down in Argentina about translating it in Spanish. I'm trying to remember if Argentina. Yes, they do speak Spanish. Um, I was like, yeah, um, there is some talks there. A lot of it is just budgetary reasons, you know, again, all that money I made from haunted hospitals. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot. So a lot of it's just. Um, the, the getting the budget to translate it. I would love to translate it in multiple languages, um, but it's more than just like direct translation from like Google using Google Translate. It's also localizing it, so making sure like it like the text makes sense for that region's right. audience. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm happy. I got a lot of uh, people international. Uh, That's awesome. People watching the show, and um, I met a lot of them through TikTok. Uh, nice. So it's, it's so nice. It's not like I, I love being able to go live any time of day and, and still being able to talk to a bunch of people. It's so That's cool. So I love technology. <laughs> All right. What another else? question. Can you do an audio book? It's easier for me. Oh, Jade Kitten. Hey, Jade Kitten. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm actually in the process of exploring that a bit. Again, it's a budget thing. Um, so I'm because ex- there's a couple ways I can go about it with. Um, voice voice actors you know either like we can do like they get a cut of the profits of the audiobook or they get a flat rate um obviously the flat rate's a little bigger um you know it's a little more robust so yeah i i do i i, I definitely want to make the book and all my books actually more accessible to a bigger audience um especially those who have accessibility reasons um it's definitely in the plans it's just more so just like budget and time um I work for a company that is notorious for having a terrible work-life balance. Um, so I kind of sometimes by the end of the day, I'm so zapped that I'm like, okay, I got to get at least 500 words in for this next book and then I'll go to bed. <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 it is in the plans and I am exploring some different options for that. So thank you for that question. It's a really good one. One thing I, I can I tell you, like we recently, uh, Eric behind the wall here, one of my coworkers, he does our outreach and he has recently taken on a project about um, converting a lot of our articles for for the magazine into audio form. Nice. Um, we had a, a gentleman who was blind contact the center and said, mm-hmm. "I'm really interested in in, for lack of a better word, reading the articles, but I can't. You know, mm-hmm. is there any audio versions? And I know like there's some podcasts and stuff that we've had, but this kind of really brought up an idea to Eric and. He really took charge and in the initiative on this and has looked into it. And at first we were doing a lot of volunteers reading articles and mm. recording it. And like I, I recorded one, I, I actually have to do a, a few more, um, but I read my own article, which is always fun. <laughs> yeah. um, but he also looked into an AI generator. Yes. Um, and that has been beautiful. Uh, he, he got onto a, a nice one. It's a subscription service, obviously, but he played a clip for me, and I didn't, I, I didn't realize it was AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was so good, and I was like, really? And it had an accent, an English accent. And I was like, oh, I could listen to this guy all day. This is really good. It makes me sound <laughs> smart. <laughs> yeah, and and it was just amazing. So, um, and all he did was importing the text. Uh, hmm. He was copy and pasting a lot of uh, chapters or articles into it, and it would just, it would do it. There was a little tweaking to do, but otherwise it was flawless. And uh, so it might be some, you know, I'll I'll talk to them tomorrow, and I'll send you a link. Yeah, to one that you use to that. Into that. All right, cool. Um, let's see. Have you covered Doris Stokes? Huge in the UK as a medium in the seventies, eighties. Quite controversial. Uh, when discovered, she'd pay, she'd pay for the first three rows in a theater and fill them with people she knew. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. <laughs> she is on the outline. Um, I think she may be on the volume three outline. It depends, but yeah, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of mediums that would do that. And I do have controversial women in the book too, because I mean they made a contribution. 
Um, I mean, Lorraine's in the first book. So, you know, there's a, there's a contribution there. Um, in volume two, I have Florence Cook. I have Usapia Palladino. Um, so, I mean, I got, I, got, I got some controversial ones. I think they still have a place. I think they're, but they're placed more so as lessons. <laughs> oh, that's good. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, you can put a positive spin on a lot of these things. And yeah, I mean, it can be a lesson in, Hey, you know, like I, that trick of filling the first couple rows with people you know is still used today. Mm -hmm. I still see that being used in in gallery readings, where yep. you we we go ahead of time and we talk to people and we find out that they've been to six, seven, eight shows already, and they know the the psychic, they know the medium, like yep. almost personally, where they they're always contacting each other, they're emailing back and forth. That's like. Why are you here? I don't I don't get it. But I mean, we know why they're there. So, all right. Uh, let's uh, let's see. I wanted to jump ahead. Uh, oh, we'll do this one. And I want to jump ahead to Tim. Tim Binga had a, a good question that's relevant. Um, so have Alex heard of Sarah Estep or Kenny Yu? She was leading expert on EVPs. Y yep. She is in volume one. So Sarah Wilson Estep, um, she, and actually I just talked to her daughter not too long ago. Um, let's see, let me find her. Yeah. Really dear lady too. When I was reading about her. Yeah. So she, so she, while she wasn't the one who brought in the, the, you know, the scale of like class A, class B, she didn't necessarily invent that, but she was responsible. One of the people responsible for bringing it over to the United States. Um, so yeah, uh, yep, she's she's right here. There she is. There she is. Yeah. So um, and actually, her daughter doesn't live too far away from me, and I actually I sent her daughter a copy of the book. Um, That's nice. Yeah. So and I did have family members chime in with the chapters too. You know, making sure like uh, I'll tell you the story of Lorraine Kenny off offline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was an adventure. Um, uh, so yeah, so I did get the families involved, um, as if they were still alive and accessible. So yeah, um, Sarah Estep, she's pretty, she was pretty cool. Um, with everything that she did with like bringing, bringing together the, the EVP community too, and maintaining it during, you know, before social media, super impressed. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Moving on. What else we got? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to get this in real quick. Tim Timothy Binga, he's our director of library, oh, uh, nice. library director here at CFI. And he was wondering, um, how do we get this book? The best way to support you more directly um, for the for the library. So yeah. I usually like I was actually going to email him uh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> but since he's watching, this is great. Um, he's Tim is awesome. Like. Anytime when when he's working, he's on out on uh, medical leave right now. But when he's in here, like he comes in in the morning, sits down, we chat every morning. So nice. Like I, he tells me what he's up to. I tell him what I'm up to. We crisscross. Like what do we need from each other? Mm -hmm. And sometimes awesome. it's like, hey, I need a, you know, I, I need this book. I wanna I wanna get this book, and he orders it right away. Um, and it, it's it's so nice. So yeah. If, He'll order your book and it'll be part of the library here. So, okay, nice. Um, is there a, a way other than like, is there a more direct way to get it directly from you or should we go um, direct? Yeah, I mean, you can get it from Amazon. I can also arrange to have an author copy sent to you so it's cheaper. Um, so basically, you would get my price, my rate for the book. So it'd be like direct. So um, we could talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah, because I can have it shipped pretty much anywhere. Um, if you want it signed, then it'll be a little bit of a different thing because it'll be shipping too. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we could chat. We could chat. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, because there might be a way. I might. I might actually get to see you soon because I know you're doing something in Gettysburg, and mm -hmm. we were planning on. We were thinking of going down because our favorite place, Hunt's Battlefield Fries, is oh my god for this year, and I'm so upset. I mean, he deserves it. I've, I've known Scott, we've known Scott for years and years mm -hmm. and love the guy, love seeing him, makes awesome food. If you're ever in Gettysburg for the rest of this season, you should go to Hunt's 
to get food because it's just amazing. Um, and when he announced that he was he was retiring after this year, I was like, oh, that's <sighs> like that's the last that's the final reason that I would want to go down there. Um, it's so good. Yeah, it's so They're good. So good. Um, yeah, my husband is snoring really loud, by the way. So if anyone, I can't hear him. That's good. I saw your your question <laughs> in the private chat. I'm like, do I hear? I don't hear him. No. So we're good. I turned the volume up. I'm like, he's, he's very crying. loud right now <laughs> <laughs> on my end. <laughs> All right. You can definitely tell his mouth is open right now. So the next question, Alex, for your book, did you research women from around the world or just women in America? Around the world. So Aiko Gibo was based in Japan. Um, I have a lot of women in Britain, which makes sense. Um, Britain, Scotland. Um, yeah, I think I think I may. Hang on. I think I, think I may have one from Russia, too. I'll have to check. But um, yeah, yep. Yeah, no, but I, I did go international, but it's like Japan and Britain and, and primarily. So, oh, France. Also got France. Okay. So, Viva la France. Cool. <laughs> All right, cool. What else we got? Uh, Parafam, do you think like in other jobs, women are not recognized enough? Yeah. Especially after I started working corporate America, it was like, oh, <laughs> like, uh, that ah. sucks. yeah yeah i mean i because as we talked um as you started talking about this like i was thinking more and more and, um and you mentioned like uh we see a lot more females as in like the role of psychic and medium um and and like back in the day that was uh more of a that there was a there was more social status there was more um I, I dare say privilege that can be obtained by by becoming a medium. Um, you could do a lot of shit that you that a female could not do normally um, and get away with a lot of stuff. Uh, but in modern times, like I see that 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 demographic of of male figures are more the tech savvy kind of guy. Uh, and then, like when we went to a psychic fair, we went to a couple psychic fairs, and it was dominated by by females mm -hmm. i could usually count how many males on, on like just my two hands how many males were in the entire conference mm -hmm. uh, including myself and yeah. uh even when we went to lilydale um there was a i walked around i was like all right this is the fifth guy that i've seen that's it like nobody else and they were most of them i was excited to be there Cause I was like, Oh, we're in Lily now. This is going to be fun. Let, let me see what I can buy and, and, and all this mm -hmm. stuff. But most of them were like the, uh, uh, usually like the husband that's in the department store holding the purse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were like, I don't really want to be here. Uh, I want right. to go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, that, that's, that's why when you said it was like, you see more females in, in the field than, than males. I was like, Oh, all right. But I guess I don't see that too much because I'm not in like I, I do hang out and do go on investigations with with groups. But I don't see I don't see the community as a whole. I don't go to a lot more paranormal conferences usually because they, they don't invite me anymore. <laughs> I mean, I try to go to some of them, but uh, most are just too far for me now. And I would love to go. There's still a few like Para Unity in New Jersey lets me They're 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 very friendly with me. They let me come out and set up. So mm -hmm. I, I love it. Um, but yeah, a lot of them, even when I approach like, Hey, I'd like to come out and visit. And some of them tell me straight up. No, um, they don't want me there. So wow. it's, sad. it's sad. So, all right. I'm, I'm rambling. Here let's are. let's go. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. How do you, how do you, how do you say that? I don't know. How do you say that? Moi? Mo, what do you say? Maeve? Mm -hmm. Maeve? Okay. I'm sorry. Like I said in the beginning, I'm not good with names. So, Maeve. Okay. How do you feel about the drama in the paranormal community? How do you think we can overcome that? I mean, we're always going to have drama in the community. It's definitely a, um, it's definitely a thing. I mean, look at what's happening with 
Cody and Satori right now. And then the week before that, it was the Enfield Demon House, you know? So there's always, and the dynamic with people in general, especially in the paranormal community and Kenny, I don't know if this is something you've noticed, but the emotional intelligence sometimes of some members of the community is a bit room for improvement, <laughs> room for improvement. And I think because a lot of times emotions are connected, it's a very emotionally charged field. I mean, Kenny, you understand, I mean, you've experienced this when, you know, people send you data or send you evidence to say, Hey, can you uh, check this out? And then you debunk it or, or you just express your thoughts out there. And then someone emails you cussing you out. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so it, it happens. I th And also there's, I mean, I don't, ex well, it's funny because I, I have a theater degree. So I came from like the entertainment world for a bit. And I will say the paranormal community has a lot more drama than dance moms and stage moms. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> <laughs> After seeing some of them shows where they have like the the little the the little girl like the beauty pageants and the mothers that wow like yeah that and I, I agree with you I, I I totally agree with you on this it, there's there's always going to be drama there's always going to be people that um, want to start shit um, there's always going to be people that are so invested in their belief. Um, and emotionally, I mean, you're, you're right. Emotion is a big part of this. It's a huge part of it where, um, people are just not invested in, in just money in equipment or time going to a place, but it becomes part of their, their, their personality. It's mm -hmm. become, becomes part of who they are, um, their identity, you know, yeah. they, they introduce themselves as a paranormal investigator, um, where like I try to usually I introduce myself as like I'm just a nerd, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like Star Wars. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Do you like yeah. Star Wars? No, we can't be friends. Um, stuff like that. But right, uh, yeah, and you get that emotional. Uh, 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 what do I what do I want to say? It's very charged up where you if you express a different opinion, then people take it personally, and mm -hmm. there is that line. There is that that almost like growing pain or learned behavior where you have to understand like this is not personal this is business like and that's how i treat everything now like this is business uh, be, I, I speak freely i i say what's on my mind if you don't agree with it you are free to, to disagree with me and we can have a mm -hmm. conversation on it um if someone gets pissed off and it becomes something where they're yelling at me or like in some of the emails that I post where they're cursing me out and hoping that I get hit by a truck and stuff like that. Like that's, that's their problem. Not mine. Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, day. yeah. That's what it comes down to. I mean, I got sent something back in May, someone telling me to unalive myself, um, which you, when you get that, it's like, Oh, okay. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. But it's yeah. like that. But I also have to look at it as how how much in pain, how how much pain is that person in to send something like that, you know, um, or how much are they writing their identity on that experience or whatever paranormal experience that they're so trying so hard to protect, right. you know? Right. And so. I, I constantly use Jason Hawes as an example mm -hmm. um, in a good way. Jason, I. I and I have been friends for 20 plus years and we are on opposite sides of the spectrum. We agree on some things. We disagree on some things and we can debate when we get together. We talk about it. Um, last, last summer we went and we hung out with him for a week and we had some conversations that were debates and we differed on a lot of things, but we also agree on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. As soon as we were done, we were still having a beer together. We still just hung out. We still, it's like, all right, good. We're done with this. Let's go, you know, let's go out and do this. Let's go to dinner. Let's get something to yeah. eat. You know, we're still friends because it's, it's, I leave that business part alone and, and mm -hmm. move on. Don't take it personally. Um, so yeah. All right. Let's, let's move on. Cause we got a couple more questions and we're over. Right at 30. Uh, Jade Kitten, as a theater person, do you like, 
Do you like musical theater? If so, what are some of favorites? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, musical theater. That's, that's actually what a lot of it. I, I majority of what I did, um, musical theater worked professionally in it for a while, for quite some time. Um, some of my favorite, favorite shows. Oh man. So I go back and forth. I'm a big Sondheim fan. So merrily we roll along, uh, company, um, I also, I'm a big fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda too. So Hamilton, you know, I, I, I love Hamilton. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, the one show that I thought I was going to absolutely despise, but I absolutely ended up loving is a show called Anne Juliet. Um, the premise of the show is what happens if Juliet woke up at, at the end of the play. And um, it's got all these songs from the early 90s and 2000s. So like Baby One More Time is in it, Larger Than Life, everybody from Backstreet Boys. And for me, I thought like, I'm not going to like this. And then I'm watching it and I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I'm hoping to get up to New York because I want to see the great, I want to see Great Gatsby, the musical. Um, okay. And Moulin Rouge. I have not seen Moulin Rouge yet. So um Oh, the, someone mentioned the prom in chat. I love the prom too. The prom is a great one. Um, yeah, no, big musical theater fan. If you ever want to talk musicals, that's, you know, come hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, all right, moving on to the next one. Uh, given your prior experience with TV land, would you do it again? Um, I think I'm in a position now where I can be very picky about TV. So with haunted hospitals, they treated me very well. Um, they also respected my wish to stay authentic as authentic as possible. Um, they did take some liberties when I saw the final product of like how the whole situation was resolved, which I was like, yeah, that's not quite how it happened, but it's not terrible. So <laughs> it's not terrible. So, um, and then with scariest places in the world, um, that was a whole collective thing. So I was like one of like, I think a dozen expert experts on screen. So, um, and again, they stayed pretty authentic with that too. So I think it's just as long as there's some authenticity with it, I'm totally fine with it. So, um, but again, I've turned down things. I've turned down opportunities mostly because it's like, is this going to be good for me? Will it be good for the community? Um, but also, you know, it's like, can I, do I want to take the time off of work? Can I take the time off of work? Can I travel? How much is covered? So, yeah. 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 I hear you. Uh, I, I mean, I, I haven't had any production companies call me <laughs> lately. I don't think they will. It's, it's usually like, Hey, you want to do this? And we'd like you to say this. And as soon as I say no, yeah, that, that's usually finished. But it's, it's. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love what I do, so I'm good. Yeah. All right. Uh, move on. Last, last question. All right. Last question. Who nice. Productions. Uh, I know you guys. I watch your videos. Uh, is AI going to be a big problem with paranormal teams showing evidence or things of interest in the future? Mm. So, <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. So where I work, um, I work a lot in the generative AI space. So, uh, I work in tech, um, and I've done a, so I do, I'm a learning experience designer. So I do a lot of sales enablement training. So I actually tra help create training for our sellers to position generative AI to customers. So I've become very familiar with the capabilities of AI, what it can do, on one side of it, I'm like, this is an opportunity to like, say if we're going, like if we wanted to analyze audio data, you know, we could teach AI to pick up anomalies. Same thing with photos. Like if we wanted to submit a photo into AI, it's like, was this manipulated? That can help streamline it too. Um, but I also see <laughs> potential issues with AI, you know, of creating and fabricating evidence. 100%. I can see that being a problem. Seeing how much AI has evolved just since two months ago, um, especially with um, 
Anthropic. Um, Anthropic is an AI company. They just released Claude 3. Um, and Claude 3 is very smart. Very, very smart. Um, to the point where I sometimes I look at stuff from Claude 3 and I'm like, I can't tell if that's been touched by a human or not. Huh. So I think photos, I think photos and video, it's still fairly obvious because there was like those traits, like, you know, the fingers and um, right. the shading, the lighting, um, that's all fairly evident still. But I think as AI continues to evolve and get smarter and these, all these companies, you know, Microsoft, um, you know, Apple, Amazon, um, they are all it's a race. Generative AI is a race and which is why it is moving so quickly. So absolutely. I think it could be a problem, but I think we just have to stay on top of it and knowing the trends of what's changing. That's a very long answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. And I like how you summed it up. You, you really do have to keep on, on top of things uh, I've been following it. Uh, we've had, actually, we've had lectures here on AI. I'm just going into it. We had, um, uh, one of my favorite speakers, Tim Redman, came in and did a, a talk just about um, photo manipulation and voice manipulation of, of people um, and just showing. And, and I mean, you can you can uh, spend about a half hour with an AI generator for for vocals and have them almost perfect. And, and as I mentioned earlier, like with the reading, with the AI uh, generation of uh, like narrative, when you feed it text. And it reads it out and i couldn't tell i mean at first I, I had no idea and the more even the more i listened to it the more i was like this sounds like a real person <laughs> like holy shit, this is scary um so yeah definitely keep up on it and yeah i mean when it when it comes to audio recordings and adding voices to like video or adding elements to a video it's already bad. I mean, I, when when I I still look at videos, I still look at photos, and I can give some opinions on it. But it's when people start figuring out how to use it, and not just the artistic versions, because those are still they they produce the uncanny valley effect um, mm -hmm. and, and stuff. But when <laughs> we get our hands on some good shit and start manipulating, yeah, that's that's a problem. Yeah, that's gonna be a problem. Yeah. So. All right, that's there's one more. There's one more? Okay, cool. Uh, Alex, has your husband had a paranormal experience? What are his thoughts? Uh, my husband is a skeptic, but he's also very supportive. Um, he's had a couple of weird experiences with me, like when we go to like haunted places, because sometimes he's my 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 buddy when you know we're driving. Um, right. so yeah, he hasn't had anything like super profound yet. Um, he did come with me on a paranormal tour of Northern Virginia, so to speak. One of my friends uh, took me out to show me some nor some places in Northern Virginia for the book I'm working on. And um, there were some times my husband was like looking at us like, this is what you do? <laughs> you know, because he hadn't actually seen me investigate before. He's okay. like, this is what you do. So, yeah, um, he's supportive. I, and I do appreciate that. That's good. All right, cool. That is it. So mm -hmm. uh, as we close the show, where can people find more about you or your books? Uh, give us your contact information. Yeah. So you can go to my website at alexmatsuo.com. Um, that's my website. Got my blog, YouTube channel. Um, you can also email me at alex at the spooky stuff.com. Um, I am working, my team and I are working on a paranormal research symposium in Gettysburg on August 17th. We closed abstract submissions a few weeks ago, and we're going to be sending out letters in a couple weeks. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, I've always wanted to do a, a paranormal conference, so to speak with my team to help further our mission of paranormal research. Um, so that's what we, what we'll be doing on August 17th. Um, some really impressive abstracts came in. I was like, okay, this is really neat. So, and also many, uh, businesses and towns in Gettysburg, um, are really excited for it. Actually, the, one of the people who runs the, one of the venues we're going to be in said, it's just really refreshing to not have a celebrity event happening here for paranormal stuff. 
So yeah. I was like, cool. Cool. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the things we're considering coming down for. Um, is it open to the public? I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we're going to start selling. I didn't want to start selling tickets until I knew, like, one, we got enough abstract submissions right. to have a have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, tickets should be going on sale hopefully in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I, ha okay. I have to talk to Steve Dills for his uh, insight on ticketing platforms. So. Steve Dills. I know Steve. <laughs> Oh, All right. Sense. That's good. Yeah. Cause I think, I think we might, if we, if we don't have anything planned, I don't think we do. We might make that like a weekend thing and, and come down and enjoy hunts. <laughs> and then I would like to come see that. And I also, I know I was talking to Dave Schumacher and he was considering coming down um, to yeah. court. So it, it should be good. All right, cool. So for everyone else, um, just want to let you guys know there will won't be a show next week because next week is very busy. Um, we're coming up on the eclipse that's happening April 8th. So I will be busy here. Don and I will be here actually decorating. And then instead of doing a show here, I know Ben Rafford will be doing a lecture via zoom about mythology behind like uh, uh, eclipses, like solar eclipse, uh, lunar eclipse, stuff like that. Um, it should be good. I think we're doing it zoom. So I'll be posting that video or at least a link to that. So you can watch that if you want to. Um, and then I'll be doing some traveling next week. I still can't tell you what I'm doing, um, but I'm going to make Alex, I'm going to make you a little jealous. I will be meeting the side eye guy um, and hanging out with him. And we're going to be spending the night together. <laughs> Just don't want to rub that in, but I am. <laughs> Might as well put salt in the wound too, Kenny. Come on. <laughs> uh, well, you know. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, lots of stuff coming up next week. Uh, so we're going to have a show the week after because we also have Melanie Teresa King. She's going to be uh, nice. hanging out here, but not for Friday night. She's not coming until Sunday. And then A.A. Ron mm -hmm. and Randy. A.A. Ron has also been on the show. He's a police officer. We talked about evidence, um, different types of evidence. Um, He's going to be here, too, uh, and his wife, Randy, for the eclipse. So we're going to have a full house. So we might do some, like, TikTok videos. We might do something. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to have fun. So with that said, um, Alex, hang out for a couple minutes. Uh, everyone else, have a great weekend. Enjoy it. Be safe. And remember, never stop learning. And we'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, all.